Welcome to worship this third Sunday in Lent, which is a game changer. Moses announces that Israel, rescued from Egypt by God, will now live in a very different way. Jesus flips over tables, announcing that now his body is replacing the temple as the point of access to God, a surprising truth that we taste in the beautiful mystery that is Holy Communion. What looks and sounds foolish, Paul explains, is really the deep wisdom of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Children of God, things are starting to open up again, and we are starting to go places. So, a little reminder that when you go to a new place, it's really important to learn the rules. When I went to my grandmother's house, there were different rules than there were at home. When you go to camp at El Camino Pines or Luther Glen, one of the first things your counselor will tell you is what the rules are for the week. There are rules at the pet store. There are rules at a restaurant. And when you get out of the grade you're in now and you get a new teacher in the fall, that new teacher will have rules for how things are going to go there. God does the same thing. After getting the people rescued from Pharaoh in Egypt. But before everybody got to be in the promised land together, 
God kind of pulled all hundreds of thousands of them over side of the road, stopped at a mountain, and said, we need to go over the rules. Before you get there, there are some rules for how you are going to live together. Because it's not going to be like Egypt, where you are miserable and unhappy, and where people treated you unfairly. You cried about that, and you were right, so I got you out of there. Well, we're not going back to that. We're going to live differently. So when we get to the new place, here are the rules. And you're going to hear them in the first lesson. Rules like no other gods. Don't settle for anything less than the real God who totally loves you. No homework on Saturdays. Everybody needs a break, rest, sleep. Don't work yourself so hard. Take a break. Honor your parents. Be good to mom and dad. Don't kill. Don't steal. Tell the truth. And don't worry about what your neighbor has. Because when you start worrying about what your neighbor has and comparing things get a little sideways. You feel bad, or then you break the steel rule. Don't worry about what they have. Be glad with what you have. Those are the rules. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for leading us to a happier and a safer, safer life. Thank you for leading our neighbors, everyone around us, to a happier and safer life. Thank you for giving us smart rules to live by so that we can be more loving and also so that others can know how to be more loving toward us. Now, Help us follow them. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
the word of the Lord. A reading from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, according to John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple? And in three days, I will raise it up. Well, the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. Tiffany France thought her son would receive his diploma this coming June, reports Chris Pabst for Fox News Baltimore. But after four years of high school, France just learned her 17-year-old must start over. He's been moved back to the ninth grade. In four years, he passed three of his 25 classes. His 0 0.13 grade point average ranks 62nd in his class of 120, middle of the pack. France says she didn't know that until February, Pabst continues. She has three children and works three jobs. She thought her oldest son was doing well because even though he failed most of his classes, he was being promoted. No one from the school told France her son was failing and not going to class. I feel like they never gave my son an opportunity. Like if there was an issue with him not advancing or not progressing that they should have contacted me first. Three years ago, said France. He's a good kid. He didn't deserve that. 
Where's the mentors? Where is the help for him? I hate that this is happening to my child. I get angry. There's nothing but frustration, said a city school's administrator who asked not to be identified for fear of retaliation. His transcript is not unusual to me. I've seen many transcripts, many report cards, like this particular student. I don't know what to do for him, France told Project Baltimore. Why would he do three more years in school? He didn't fail. The school failed him. The school failed at their job. They failed. They failed. That's the problem here. They failed. They failed. When Jesus stepped into the temple, he saw a system that was failing people. He did not crack the whip on the sinners seeking forgiveness or even the money changers doing their job or any of the faithful and flawed individuals doing their religious duty. The religion itself needed to be killed and born again. In that system, the temple was the one holy place where dwelt the one holy God, who graciously provided a way for unholy humans to purge their sin and purify themselves in order to become righteous enough to be with God. Well, the way for this to happen was through the proper sacrifice of approved animals. Because many people could not logistically provide their own approved animal, temple vendors provided the helpful, convenient service of identifying ritually clean animals and selling them right there at the entrance to the temple. There were also money changers because most people have Roman coins in their pocket. And Roman coins have the graven image of Caesar claiming to be a god, which violates God's commandment. That will not do, especially when the whole point is to overcome sin and get right with God. So, the money changers provided currency exchange for a very modest fee. They weren't making a killing on the exchange rate, just enough to cover expenses, keep people gainfully employed, keep the economy going. The prices were reasonable. And there were smaller animal options for the poor. And what could be more important for anyone to spend whatever income they have on? than their relationship with God. It was all very reasonable, just like 16th century indulgences. The problem is not that we change money. The problem is that money changes us. When God makes a way, humanity sets up a toll booth. The history of religion is littered with one example after another of grace exploited for gain. 
the goodness of God, haggled, hoarded, guarded, and peddled at a markup. And lest we Lutherans, with our insistence on grace as God's free gift, become smug about ourselves. Remember that the young man who shot up the church in Charleston went to an ELCA Sunday school. Remember that the BTK killer was the president of his ELCA congregation. Our system failed them and their victims. There is blood on our hands too. Which is why we need some reliable way to get right with God again. John's Gospel announces that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the temple, the meeting place of God and humanity, freely available and accessible to all. Jesus promises to draw all people to himself, which he does at the cross, where his three years are rejected as an abject failure, where the principal himself is expelled, where the whole busted system comes crashing down where God starts over. Notice what happens in the midst of the temple chaos. Animals run wild in the temple of the Lord, alive and free and probably staining things. Coins Graven images of an idol roll into the holy house of God. Sinful, unclean people are able to stroll in without performing the proper sacrifices. The temple itself is violated, desecrated, made unclean. Human hands are not suddenly clean. God's hands are dirty. Which is to say, God is with us at last. And the whole system designed to bring us and God together is discarded in order to bring God and us together. Now the place where God and humanity come together shifts from a holy building to a broken body. In his book, The Heart of Christianity, Marcus Borg explains. According to temple theology, certain kinds of sins and impurities could be dealt with only through sacrifice in the temple. Temple theology thus claimed an institutional monopoly on the forgiveness of sins, and because the forgiveness of sins was a prerequisite for entry into the presence of God, 
Temple theology also claimed an institutional monopoly on access to God. In this setting, to affirm Jesus is the sacrifice for sin was to deny the temple's claim to have a monopoly on forgiveness and access to God. It subverted the sacrificial system. It meant God and Jesus has already provided the sacrifice and has taken care of whatever you think separates you from God. You have access to God apart from the temple and its system of sacrifice. It is a metaphor of radical grace, of amazing grace. No longer do we have to go to God's house. Now God comes to ours. We are not in the temple. The temple is in us. The renewed temple, the broken and buried and resurrected body, the way to God with dirty hands named Jesus is the bread and the identity that we share around our table where God calls to us and to all people in the words of the prophet Isaiah, you that have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food the body of Christ, given for you, the blood of Christ, shed for you, the life of Christ, stolen and risen for you, the very heart of God, the treasure you can never earn or afford, unprotected and placed in your hands like a free diploma. Let's play.
Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on heavy, ec healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O oh God. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering especially with coronavirus, financial hardship, extended trauma, and pandemic fatigue. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O oh God. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O oh God. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for perpetua felicity in all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once again, this Sunday, as this time of loving isolation continues for a few more weeks, we are treating our entire congregation as homebound members. Enormous thanks to everyone who will be delivering consecrated elements today to those within a reasonable distance of our sanctuary. In their company, from a safe social distance with gloved hands. I celebrated Holy Communion this morning 
blessing the elements that are being delivered. This is our best effort to honor the real presence of Christ, a teaching of tremendous importance to Martin Luther at the heart of Holy Communion. I prayed over these gifts of food and drink. Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people Israel through the desert and provided them water from the rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit on this holy food and on all the baptized who share this feast. Wash away our sin that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Faith in Action this week. On Saturday, we will be once again collecting food and supplies for local pantries from 10 a.m. to 12 noon at the office entrance on Kittredge. So please bring your goods, which we will share with pantries in Canyon Country and Van Nuys and North Hollywood, feeding our hungry neighbors. And this month, there is a bonus collection of an important and often forgotten item. In honor of International Women's Day, tomorrow, March 8, we are asking additionally for new feminine hygiene products to be donated because those are often overlooked but very necessary for many folks in need. So if you can bring those along with our regular uh, offerings of food, we will be most grateful and able to help our neighbors in need. Our Lenten Wednesday Zoom gatherings continue uh, for three more weeks, our journey about why church. Join us at 6 p.m. for virtual soup summer, supper and all the nonsense conversation that goes along with that. And then at 6.30, a time of worship and reflection together around the question, why church? Why do we do this at all? Soon we will be doing it together, in person, on our lawn. Easter Sunday, 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. will be our grand reopening, our return to in-person live streamed worship together. Please, please, I'm begging you now, please. 
pre-register if you plan to join us. And do so now. Don't wait. Do it right now or this week at least because we are trying to hold many, many, many spots open for visitors. It's Easter. That's when visitors come. And so a lot of people will not pre-register. You can help us out by doing so, by pre-registering if you plan to be with us. Because spaces are limited, we can only have a certain capacity. So after 100, we're full up. So if there's 500 of you out there listening to me right now who want to be with us Easter Sunday, register now. And if all the spots fill up, we still have time to consider adding another service, perhaps. But we won't know unless you RSVP by pre-registering at our website, sovlc.org. Please do that as soon as possible to help us plan and prepare for a celebration that will have room and space enough for everyone. Receive the benediction. God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.